Today is Wednesday, December 10th, 2003, and this is the beginning of an interview with Dennis Neal at my home at 1711 South Quincy Avenue in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mr. Neal is 51 years old, having been born on... March 18th, 1952. Uh, my name is Laura Belmonte, and I'll be the interviewer along with... Robert Sears. Dennis Neal is one of the founders of Tulsa Oklahomans for Human Rights. He is currently a member of the board and is active in several other organizations in Tulsa. And we will now begin. Um, the way I've categorized these questions are in various areas, um, and we'll kind of go back and forth across time. Uh, we'll start with some personal things. Um, would you classify yourself as homosexual, bisexual, or heterosexual for most of your adult life? Homosexual. If you, if homosexual, how long have you been out, and when did you have your first homosexual experience? Hmm, how, how do you think I should define out? How would you define out, Lori? Out, out to yourself, you can define it differently if you'd like, okay. you know, out to yourself, and as opposed to out to the public, maybe you want to talk about both. Right. Oh, I, I guess I probably really first talked to a family member, my sister, back in, like, 1979. Um, and then that was an interesting conversation because she uh, made me um, very uncomfortable. By uh, She figured out what I came over to talk to her about, but it was about uh, being gay. And it turned out that after putting me through this excruciating pain, <laughs> trying to explain to her about being gay, she said, well, it's no big deal because I'm gay also. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, it was just interesting coming out story together, I guess. Uh, but I probably first uh, uh, had some, like, uh, first sexual experience while I was in law school, my second year of law school, and then in the third year of law school, I actually developed a relationship with a um, uh, law student that continued for a few months or so, and then probably really became more or less out to people outside of my, my um, sister um, in the early 80s as we got active with also promised for human rights and some activities through the American Civil Liberties Union and so forth. So I would have been um, out of law school for about three years before I really got kind of involved with ACLU and TOHR and became more out. I see. Let's back up a little bit and talk some. Are you a native Oklahoman? Correct. And where were you born? Ponca City. Well, actually, I grew up in Ponca City, but I was born in Oklahoma City. But my parents were already living in Ponca City when I was born. And your family background, education? Uh, my background, mm -hmm. so I grew up in Palm City, went to public schools there, and then graduated in 1970 from Palm City High School, and went for four years at Oklahoma State as a political science major, and then joined about seven others that uh, I'd been running around with to some extent at Oklahoma State, and we all went to the University of Texas, and we all graduated from the University of Texas in 1977. Did you work as an attorney for a while? Or? Yes, I was with uh, Connor and Winters, a large law firm in Tulsa, for four years and left there in May of 1981 and went with my present employer, Samson Resources Company. Okay. Um, did your sexual preference create problems for you or between you and your family? Uh, certainly for me, I, I remember that first summer of being in Tulsa after law school, studying for the state bar, because I came to Oklahoma to take my bar as opposed to staying in Texas. Uh, that summer, um, I dealt, was dealing with a lot of just emotional um, issues, getting into the workforce, studying for the bar, trying to really deal with uh, my sexuality in this relationship with a law student who is now living in Dallas and was pursuing um, his career, and then a couple of the other law school friends found out about that, and one became very jealous about that relationship, mm -hmm. and it turned out it was primarily because uh, he also came out a few years later, so I think there was some emotional attachment there that wasn't apparent in that first summer of 1977 when I was here in Tulsa, but um, that was probably the most difficult period of time I had uh, but the sexuality issue was tied up with all the other issues of joining the workforce, studying for the bar. I didn't really know people in town. Um, didn't feel comfortable coming out to anybody at the law, at the law firm. So I was trying to internalize 
his sexuality, although I he did start going to some of the gay bars by um, the latter part of 1977. Uh, and I, I recall going to a few bars in Oklahoma City in the summer of 1977. I just wasn't comfortable going to the bars here in Tulsa, so I was going to Oklahoma City. Right. Uh, did you ever come out at your employer? Um, I, I came out to several of the lawyers there, and in 1980 or 1981, as we were starting to form TOHR, I did approach one of the junior partners and ask him if he thought I should have a discussion with the other lawyers at the firm, particularly the partners. And that probably was in 1980, probably the spring of 1980, and he discouraged me at that time to actually visit with the other partners. He thought it would um, affect my career. So I did not, but I still stayed very active with THR and some of the ACLU activities that mm -hmm. I was doing at that time mm -hmm. and just let things kind of progress naturally from there, I guess. Right. You've mentioned your sister's reaction, which mm -hmm. uh, was interesting nonetheless. Uh, how about your parents? Do you have any other siblings? Well, it was interesting, actually, when uh, I do have a brother and um, we've really not talked about my sexuality. And then with regard to my parents, my dad died in... Um, uh, June of 1980 from, uh, actually uh, October of 1980 from the key man. Prior to his death, he would kind of kid around on the telephone when they'd call over here and say, oh, you going out with your gay friends uh, tonight? And my mother would say, oh, shut up, Bill. Uh, let's not talk about those kind of issues. But I never really had a discussion with my parents. I still have never had a real discussion with my mother, although she's very aware of my long-term partner and we travel together all the time, and I travel with a lot of other guys that are obviously coupled. Uh, and so it's just never been a discussion. I, mean, I, I would have had the discussion with her a long time ago, but it was my sister's hesitancy to discuss her sexuality and with my mom, and she didn't particularly want me to discuss it. And so I honored her wishes, but we've both been in long-term relationships for quite some time on the travels with the four of us to some extent, so there's certainly no secrets. Just probably figured it out. No, right absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> How about, um, have you ever had clashes with coworkers or neighbors pertaining to your sexuality? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so, Laura. The, the only thing I can really recall is probably a couple years after I, actually it's probably within a year or so joining uh, my current employer, uh, one of the board members of the company really was concerned about um, some of my public involvement, particularly with the ACLU, because I was still representing some clients um, for the ACLU, and I ended up on the front page of the newspaper when we were trying to, um, I think, convince uh, the city council to ease up on uh, the harassment of prostitutes, and so I was quoted on the front page with regard to our representation of some uh, prostitutes or, or an advocacy group, Coyote, I think, would be advocacy mm -hmm. group, um, for prostitutes, and he just was not very pleased that I showed up there, particularly because I was also a public spokesman for the company. So I kind of understood his concern, <laughs> right. and so I eased off on my involvement, public involvement with the ACLU and kind of respected his wishes. And that's the only thing I recall, except that in like 83 or 84, um, I had a housekeeper that evidently found some of my advocacy stuff and mentioned to uh, a partner in the law firm uh, that, oh, this guy must be homosexual. And, and he communicated that to some of my coworkers and they said, hey, it's not any of our business, but you might want to know that this lawyer over at Connor and Winters is spreading some um, uh, stories about you and, and potentially being homosexual. So I remember storming over the law firm and <laughs> demanding an audience with that particular lawyer and visiting with him about um, his um, interest in spreading these stories through a mutual housekeeper who I've been fired. And um, he, he did not deny it. He said, I made a mistake and apologized to me. So life goes on. So that's really the only encounter that I can recall of related to the workplace. And I really don't think with regard to neighbors or anything like that, there have been any issues that I can recall in 20 some odd years. Have you ever experienced any harassment or vandalism pertaining to your public face in the community mm -hmm. on gay, gay and gay related issues? Uh, I think I've been on two radio programs at two different times where just the call in, people would kind of attack right. you 
for being who you are. And then um, I do recall one time outside of Zippers, which was a popular disco in the uh, early 80s and mid 80s, uh, taking in some material for TOHR, probably the newsletter or something. It's probably about 1130 at night. And I got clobbered uh, uh, by somebody putting their fist through their window and into my eye and um, getting clobbered by these probably teenage kids that were driving from that neighborhood mm -hmm. and come up to me and say, you know, and the bars are around here and I stupidly bit down there and I popped them in the eye. Uh, but there's actually kind of an interesting story about that incident uh, in the, the next night, which was a sunny night and I had a black eye. Um, a friend of mine came by and said, let's go out. And I said, there's no way I'm going out tonight. I've got this black eye. And he said, no, let's go down to the inner urban downtown and have dinner. And I said, oh, okay. So I put on this Hawaiian print shirt and had on shorts and went to the inner urban. And then he said, okay, now let's go to the zippers and have a drink. And I said, there's no way I'm going back down to the zippers tonight after getting clobbered outside of zippers the night before. And he said, no, let's go have a drink. We no more than walked in and the cops followed us in and it was uh, a violation, of course, to serve liquor by drink at that time. And they proceeded to bust the bar and haul off uh, the, the door person and the bartender. Uh, was, I know, hauled haul off two of the bartenders. And so the door person asked me to go down to the jail to get them out. So we went to the jail. Here I was in my Hawaiian print shirt, shorts, and a black eye, trying to get these people out on OR on my recognizance. Mm -hmm. And the jailer said, who are you? And I said, I'm a lawyer. And I had to show him my card. And then he asked for two more forms of identification for me to bail those people out. And then lo and behold, a, uh, uh, a male secretary at the law firm which I wasn't with anymore, but I recognized him. He was in the background. He was being booked on public intoxication. So I said, give that guy my business card and see if he wants me to get him out. So he said, sure. So here I had this male secretary and two gay bartenders in my little convertible with my black on my Hawaiian print shirt and dropped them off the bar and dropped him off at his house. <laughs> and then I go to work the next day and this guy, uh, oh, I was at the law firm because this lawyer, one of the younger lawyers said, how'd you get that black on? Well, you know, fight over some woman or was it over a man? And I just remember saying, ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. And of course, burst out laughing because he sure pegged that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about, um, you've mentioned some of the, you've mentioned zippers and some of the other clubs. So mm -hmm. um, what kind of bars were in Tulsa when you first came out? And um, then you mentioned not going to them for any of the Oklahoma City one. Mm -hmm. Talk a bit about why you that was your preference and any of the clubs uh, you remember there. Sure. Um, in, in in the 1977 time frame when I was coming out, what I recall here was probably um, uh, a couple of bars in the downtown area, um, being the Taj Mahal and Caruso's and oh gosh the zebra and a few others. And I, I can recall going into the Taj Mahal probably in 1977, but I started going to Oklahoma City because my sister lived there. And I, I went to, with, with two other gay guys that lived at the same building I lived at, at Center Plaza downtown, it took me over to Oklahoma City and kind of first introduced me to some of the bars over there. And one was the Spree Spirit, which was on class and it was a real popular dance bar. It was in an old church that had been converted to this gay disco. And it was a, a blast, a great place to go to. And in that environment, I met several people that then became very good friends of mine that worked in Oklahoma City. And so I just got in the habit of going over to Oklahoma City and kind of partying with them and spending the night at one person's house or the other person's house and so on. And now that also developed a relationship with um, a couple of individuals in particular that that got me involved with the Oklahoma for Human Rights in Oklahoma City. And through that relationship, then we have ultimately brought a chapter here to Tulsa. So out of uh, that partying activity came hopefully uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma for Human Rights, at least uh, some of the spark would help uh, get that going. And then by the, probably the second year uh, while I was here in Tulsa, I got much more comfortable by meeting some people, including the Center Plaza and elsewhere going out a little bit more, and uh, we had the um, old plantation, which was near 51st and the was a disco bar, and then Zippers tried to open up as um, as uh, Sweetwater Station. And where had Zippers been? 
Tippers was at uh, 3030 Winston, mm -hmm. and, and the guy that opened it, George Kravis, tried to originally open it as a straight bar, but so many people knew of him and knew that he was gay, that several gay people showed up there like the opening night, and I think I was there the opening night the next night. Can very apparent that uh, there's a, going to be a tendency to make it a, a gay and lesbian bar, and he tried to kind of make us uncomfortable there trying to make it a straight bar and failed as a straight bar and so they reopened it as a gay bar and it was a very successful gay bar for a number of years so that's where many of us used to visit as well as uh, the bars there on 11th street tms and uh, tracy's is tracy on 11th no i guess he was on third street wasn't he? Oh, okay i think that that bar was on third street but there's kind of little circles and bars that we now were these bars co-ed or were they mainly men's bars or i would say they were mainly men except for uh, old plantation the disco and zippers the disco and they were relatively mixed at that point in time um and and then even zippers early on would have a, a, a small number of straight people there too because the music was good and the environment was good and all that kind of mm -hmm. Good stuff, but there was pretty good mixing, of, as I would call it. Zippers, you know, the Tim's uh, there at 11th and Utica was, was definitely primarily male, mm -hmm. and Toolbox Tracy's Toolbox was primarily male as well. And there were a couple of uh, women's bars out on Memorial, some of which may still be there because I, I did go out there some for some of the social activities with THR and take THR material and right. so forth. Right. But there's pretty good segregation, I guess, between the uh, females and the males, except zippers is kind of the melting pot, I guess you could say. How about racial mixing? Yes, it was definitely, um, zippers, there definitely was a racial mixing. And oh, and there was the crash landing, another disco that was quite popular for about four or five years up at Fifth and Lewis. And it was very mixed, and, and there was a fair number, of, uh, there were a fair number of African Americans that would come to. The crash, and I remember African Americans at um, Zippers as well. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know if there was another bar that catered mainly to minorities or not, and, and I don't even know if that's true today. Mm -hmm. I'm not that familiar. Mm -hmm. You alluded to this one incident where the police came uh, to enforce the uh, drink by the glass law. Mm -hmm. Were there other incidents that you recall where police were? harassing patrons of these bars for reasons not pertaining to ABC laws? Uh, not too much at Zippers. Zippers got busted, as I recall, several times for violating the liquor by the drink, but that was probably not unusual for many of the bars in the Tulsa environment at that time. It kind of depended on who the uh, police chief was or the assistant police chief, how hard they got in the bars for violating liquor by the drink. I think Zippers probably attracted more cops because of the, the gay bar nature, but I think it was more out of curiosity than it was harassment. I think they were just kind of interested in, in the whole scene there. It was a very energetic bar, and, and there were many times the cops would be watching the crowd, but I don't recall them really bothering the patrons that much at Zippers. And honestly, it was some point comfortable to have them in the neighborhood because there had been some harassment by teenagers or young males uh, toward the gay patrons. Now, um, Tim's was a little bit different at 11th and Utica. I remember he wrote three or four letters to the police chief complaining about police harassment, getting shut down, harassing his patrons. But as I recall, and, and a guy named Mike Green that was our um, treasurer, when the first one POHR and the lawyer that represented several of the bar owners has a better recollection of this. But actually there was a female cop on, on that beat who really had, had it in for the gay boys going to the gay bar. And she was very tough on, on Tim and his bar and, and really harassed that that bar according to Tim and probably Mike Green. And I think they finally convinced the chief of police to move her to another beat and things got much more friendly between the cops and the, and the bar scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there had been harassment, I think, right before I came to Tulsa. And in fact, I think it might have been in the paper where several gay patrons of a downtown bar were arrested in like 1976 or 77 for jaywalking. 
and then they were outside of the big bar, and that was probably definitely harassment. But now that came some pushback, I think, as I understand, by the gay community and some of the straight community, and it seemed to improve the police community relations mm -hmm. over time. Um, did, do you have a strong network of gay friends and or acquaintances? Yes, very much so. Um, has that always been the case? Did you find it easy to make gay friends here? Yes, mm -hmm. very much so. And how did you meet most of these people? Oh, probably initially through the gay bars. Um, I can't remember any professional associations, at least early on, in which I made friends, at least in Tulsa, it was primarily through the gay bars. Now, of course, out of that, then we developed some other activities, and then I met many more people probably outside of that environment after that. Um, I did stay in touch with four or five of my law school friends, three or four of which then either were gay or turned out to be gay sometime after mm -hmm. law school. So through that um, association. I had those friends and then met some other friends in other parts of the country because those people tended to go to Houston to practice or wanted to Washington, D.C. and so on. So I'd go up there and visit them and you'd see people in that environment. But um, I think most of the early interaction within Tulsa was probably um, in the gay bars either here or in Oklahoma City where I made my friends and some of them are certainly good friends today. Mm -hmm. How visible would you describe the gay community in Tulsa at large in the late 70s? And how do you feel that has changed over time, if at all? Um, yeah, uh, I think in, in the late 70s and early 80s, Laura, one of the reasons we really got Tulsa Oklahoma's for Human Rights going is I don't recall there being visibility at all or any organization and, and I think our immediate focus was being comfortable being gay and being who we are and outside of the, the bar environment you know what more can we offer for those that certainly may still be interested in the bars but also want other activities and a little bit of advocacy thrown in there and then some people are just more comfortable with the bars so when we start talking about forming Tulsa Oklahoma's for Human Rights or Oklahoma's for Human Rights a chapter of Oklahoma Cities Oklahoma's for Human Rights. I don't recall that we had any benchmark other than Oklahoma's for Human Rights in Oklahoma City. I do not recall anything being there in Tulsa. Shortly after we started talking, we became aware of John Ferris, who had attempted to start a group in like 1976, and I recall having a discussion with him as we were forming TOHR, and he had mentioned that he had gotten a lot of grief trying to be public as a, a gay male, uh, as a gay man in, in uh, Tulsa. And he felt he'd lost his job over an attempt to form an early um, gay and lesbian movement. And not that he was particularly being discouraging, but just said it was going to be a rough road to uh, hoe at that period of time. But um, I just, I think our models were probably um, the Oklahoma City chapter and just getting connected with, through them, there's maybe some of the people in Dallas and some of the other organizations that have been around for a longer period of time. Did you feel that the decision to form TOHR was in response to some of the national trends going on with gay rights activism in the 70s? With, you know, there was a sweeping growth of gay activism post Stonewall, and then, of course, the rise of the backlash with the Save Our Children movement and Anita Bryant, right, former Miss Oklahoma. Uh, appearing in 1977, do you, do you recall whether or not those were part of the catalyst for organizing? Yeah, absolutely, because we, we I remember at some of our first meetings, we'd have some clippings of the news coming out on a national level about what was happening in the GLBT movement, and that some of that was going to be our inspiration. And very early on in TOHR, we, we worked hard to get some of those speakers that were making the news for uh, GLBT rights. Uh, to Tulsa to try to stimulate the awareness of the uh, gay movement that was occurring throughout America at that time. So definitely that was the case. And, and those of us that got, that got the organization going early on, a couple of us had been pretty active as uh, lawyers or law students in various causes, so that was kind of natural. And then with Mike Green, a lawyer, having been so involved with the, the bars representing the bars, I think he was he was concerned about 
maybe some of the har harassment that the bars had in the past received from the cops, so he was kind of probably a little bit from that angle. And then another guy that was just so interested in, in the whole concept of civil rights and organization and moving Tulsa forward and all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you've mentioned a few clashes with teenagers and you know, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, how about your friends? Uh, what kind of relationships with the police and religious authorities and the city government do you have your friends had? Um, has anyone had anything particularly um, notable, either positive or negative? Well, yeah, no, that's interesting. I, I don't recall, Laura, that coming up with my immediate circle of friends when we <clears throat> were doing a couple of studies in the 90s, we try to document harassment in the Tulsa um, environment. Clearly, we had some incidences, but it, it was probably people, it was with people that I, I'm not just that familiar with. So I'm not familiar with <clears throat> what caused the attacks against them, even, which might read the newspaper or read the TOHR, mm -hmm. so forth. But certainly during the years, as, as I worked with ACLU, TOHR, met people that said, yes, they've definitely been subject to harassment, lost their job difficulty with their family, and it's very clear that that's occurred in the Tulsa uh, environment, but not directly with my immediate friends. Right. Well, let's talk about the why and when did you form THR and with whom? Um, I, after law school and, and moving to Tulsa... Uh, and what year was that? That was 1977, mm -hmm. and within about 1978, early 1979, through my affiliation with a law firm, I got involved in the Tulsa chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. And um, it was a very active chapter at, at that point in time because Lou Bullock, who still lives here and has been a longtime advocate for um, youth rights and the rights of the incarcerated and so forth, had to case going against the state of Oklahoma on prison conditions. And he was active in the ACLU here, got lots of press off of that, ultimately won his case against the state of Oklahoma. And basically the state of Oklahoma prison system became under federal uh, trusteeship to change its standards to a constitutional level. So meeting uh, some different people locally through the ACLU was a very um, energizing experience because they were so involved in civil rights and, and, and issues like that. And um, I was going to Oklahoma City for some of the various meetings of the state chapter of the ACLU. And so between meeting some of the people at the ACLU level and some of the people in the gay movement in Oklahoma City with Oklahoma's for Human Rights, it just became, it became a natural thinking, boy, we really need this gay and lesbian oriented function in Tulsa. And so, in addition to being active with the ACLU, um, started talking to some friends about forming a Tulsa chapter of Oklahoma's for Human Rights. And many of the people that we initially worked with in Oklahoma City had been involved with the ACLU too. So we were all kind of wearing the two hats uh, okay. and the commonality of interest and could share ideas between the ACLU and, and the gay rights. And, and the members and the board of, of the ACLU at that time we're really kind of leading the edge on, on pushing for gay rights. You know, it's been an issue at the national level probably since Stonewall, and was really starting to become an issue at the Oklahoma level, trying to support the rights of um, the disadvantaged and people involved in, in, in the gay and lesbian communities in Oklahoma City in particular. And so you took on some of the initial cases to uh, protect rights because they had some harassment issues over there. And they, contact the ACLU attorneys there. We had gotten some word here of some of the harassment being ACLU volunteer mm -hmm. attorneys, so our interest level was up a little bit. But um, Bill Rogers, who had helped form the chapter in um, Oklahoma City of um, Oklahomans for Human Rights, became a good friend of mine, both through the ACLU and through just socializing with Bill and some of his friends. And he was a very activist attorney and a great guy and was really our inspiration for starting the chapter here. So Bill and a few of his friends 
came over here and started meeting with some of the close friends I had made, either through zippers or some other social connections, and got us um, dialoguing about forming this Tulsa chapter. So um, I remember going out to Oklahoma City and negotiating with the, the uh, Oklahoma for Human Rights for how to set up the chapter, having them amend their bylaws and bringing that back. Here and I imagine that Bob English and Mike Green and I kind of just drafted the, the charter and the bylaws as a chapter and then started recruiting the other people to, to join us. And our initial focus was really again kind of that idea of more being comfortable, being gay, being who we are, and then we quickly started taking up a few social issues for a couple of years around the Christmas holidays. We would find a couple of families to adopt. Uh, they would tend to be um, out in straight community, but they have kids, and so we gather up gifts at the bars and canned food and so on and take it to our adopted family. And I think we found those families, as I recall, through the Salvation Army. Um, and we did that for a few years, and we had a holiday program, and then we just started these monthly meetings. Um, and our first monthly meeting was um, late in 1980, and it was a psychiatrist that came and talked to us about being gay and being comfortable being gay, because that's our initial focus, is really making members of our community feel comfortable being who they are so they can become more involved with the community at large. How did you get the word out to the community about these meetings, and where was this meeting held? Postings in the bars. I'm sure it was probably our initial um, uh, method of communication. And our first meeting was at Harwelden, which is the mansion here in Town that the Arts and Humanities Council now has its headquarters in. We had a meeting in the basement, and I think it was in November of 1980 was our first meeting. And out of that, we slowly um, started focusing on these monthly meetings, and, and then we uh, went to All Souls Unitarian and had meetings there for about six months or so, and had very regular meetings. And then we went to a community um, room at the um, uh, consortium, which is at 35th in Peoria. Uh, a guy named Nelson Kuyper let us use that community center on the second level of that building. So we did that for a while, and then we ultimately ended up at Aronson Auditorium at the Tulsa City County Library. Um, and then we ended up going to a large auditorium um, that the uh, First, uh, First National Bank made of, I mean, uh, yeah. First National Bank made available to us mm -hmm. in downtown that served us for a number of years. And what kind of attendance did these meetings have? How did it change over time? I think our first meeting with the psychiatrist, uh, we probably had 20 people. Um, and then through the 80s, now I may be wrong, maybe we went to Aronson after we'd been at the bank. I'm not real sure exactly the order of that. But um, I think in 83 to 85, when our meetings were really clicking, um, I think we probably had anywhere from 80 to 150 at the monthly meetings because there weren't really a lot of other organizations that people could participate in as uh, lesbians and gays. And by 83, 84, the interest in um, uh, GRID gay related immune deficiency was so high and we were one of the few sources of information in the gay community about what then became labeled as AIDS that our meetings when they were focused on that issue the numbers just skyrocketed. One time I think we had 200 we had standing room only at the first national bank auditorium in like 1983, 1984. So we were really the first group to really do outreach on that issue and, and really uh, attracted a lot of interest, obviously, in the health issues of the... And, and what did TOHR do? Because I, I know eventually there was a break between TOHR and AIDS activism. If you could right. speak to some of the origins of that. Sure. Um, early on, like even in 82, 83, we really recognized health issues as being very important, particularly for the gay males who tend to be sexually active. And... Bob Caesar, a good friend of mine, really worked with us in the Tulsa City County Health Department in having STD clinics in the bars. So I think we did that probably before up in the city did, where we actually set up a little area in the bars, typically in one of the restrooms or a back room, 
and they had uh, a couple of nurses come in, generally from the health department, and then Bob Caesar was also a, a nurse at that time, and they do the swabs to test for gonorrhea and syphilis and just kind of do a little general health check. So um, early on, we kind of had this health focus, and we have some of our early materials that were health focused in, in the gay community. But then as AIDS became very important, um, in 1983, I remember Jeff Beal, Dr. Beal, who was one of the first physicians to do outreach on HIV in the Tulsa community, and I went to the second or third annual meeting, probably the same annual meeting of physicians and related healthcare people in Denver, Colorado, national meeting on what was to become AIDS and HIV. And Jeff and I both became so aware that this was going to be a significant issue because it was starting to come in from the coast and start mm -hmm. affecting the South and the Midwest. So we came back and had some more meetings at, at the TOHR level and really stepped up our education efforts. And I remember like in late 83 or early 84, Jeff helped facilitate one of our monthly meetings. And that was the first time I remember somebody coming into the meeting that had HIV and, and had AIDS because he came in in a wheelchair. And his presence really dramatized the issue for so many in that meeting. I mean, there was like 150 people there. But see him come in emancipated and in a wheelchair, I think really brought home the message that AIDS is here in the Tulsa community. So within the next year after that, when we started having deaths in our community related to HIV and AIDS, um, it really became aware to many of us that um, this is going to take a much bigger effort than what TOHR had been doing with the testing clinics and the education campaign and so forth. So many of us that were active in TOHR helped set up Shanti, which was an effort to not only step up the education efforts, but also find a home to take care of those that were living with um, AIDS and develop a, a residence program, much like what Oklahoma City had developed called the WINS, which is actually still land. And that was one of our models, and the Shanti Project was out of San Francisco. It was very much oriented at, at um, caregiving and residential um, environment for people living with um, HIV. So we had some fundraisers around that. Never really got the house concept off ground because it's just so uh, prohibitively expensive for our ability to raise funds. We realized we had to mainstream this issue, and fortunately, the um, uh, Community Service Council of Tulsa was starting to really realize that AIDS was going to be a major issue. And convened, convened a couple of meetings that TOHR participated in, Shanti participated in but really took the leadership under Joan Flint, who was with the Community Service Council, and uh, a great woman who, who still is involved in, in some AIDS efforts today, uh, to get all the straight organizations together with their represent, representation, and then TOHR, and Shanti, and, and the Red Cross, and a few others to really say, we got a major issue here. So it was out of that group that the Tulsa AIDS Coalition kind of formed and became a monthly or quarterly gathering of all the different organizations to focus on this issue. And Shanti really, since it couldn't deliver on the housing, decided to more or less pull back and, and ultimately became a care team concept so that one-on-one -on -one people would provide assistance to somebody living with AIDS. We kind of gave up on the residential uh, issue, but fortunately Catholic Charities picked it up and then developed uh, St. Joseph's House, which is still around as a great center for eight or ten people that are living with HIV. So fortunately, a, a basically straight organization picked up that cause mm -hmm. and has delivered a very important piece to the HIV equation here in Tulsa by providing that house. And other groups have done the same. You know, out of Jones group, it stimulated a lot of discussion. The Red Cross stepped forward and became much more active in HIV and AIDS education in, in Tulsa, uh, Tulsa County Red Cross, I mean, Tulsa uh, City County Health Department has always been really very cooperative on that issue. And we had a director at that period of time when AIDS was just coming to the forefront that was not sticking his head in the sand and really wanted to help head off this epidemic. He became quite involved and helped drag in the state a little bit with the state health department and 
in detecting some federal funds. So I think it was a recognition at one point for the TOHR because it needed to stay a little bit focused on advocacy and promoting um, equal rights for the, the GLBT community that was going to be very difficult to get state funds in the state of Oklahoma. Because no matter how much we would separate our activities from the HIV and AIDS issues, the state could not get comfortable with one organization handling that pot of money from the state. Mm -hmm. So it became important to split the groups to be sure that we got state and federal money to help tackle the HIV AIDS issues. I find it interesting that it sounds like the Tulsa establishment responded pretty progressively to AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in comparison to the original response in New York or San Francisco, for instance. Right. Is, is that your sense of it? or yeah. would you? I, I think very early on, Laura, it, it really became a partnership between those of us in the gay community and those of us in the straight community. And it was really due to the leadership of the Community Service Council and Joe Flint and Janice Nicholas, who was a part-time staff person with Community Service Council, primarily working on women's issues. And she said, you know, this issue of HIV and AIDS is really going to be very significant. And very progressive people at the Red Cross and the Tulsa County Health Department. Very quickly, we got a lot of assistance from um, the mainstream organizations. Part of that is because we built that relationship with the Tulsa City County Health Department since 82 when we were doing the STD testing. Because, you know, there's no secret that syphilis and gonorrhea was epidemic in the gay community. Uh, probably in the late 70s and early 80s mm -hmm. because of the promiscuity that was uh, very uh, apparent in, in the young gay male population at that time. And, and our health department was very willing to go into the bars with us, do the education, do the testing, come back and give the results, and so we developed that rapport. And so I think, I think it was the maturity of, of those of us that had been working with the health department and some of the other groups, and it wasn't in your face, you know, act up probably would not have worked well in our community. It was that building the coalition with the, the Red Cross and the health department. So very early on, they they were, they being those mainstream institutions were very instrumental mm -hmm. in addressing the AIDS issue. Let's step back from AIDS for a second and talk more generally about the political culture of Tulsa. Um, as I understand it, Tulsa adopted or explored uh, a human rights ordinance in 1978, which was seen as a model from, through the world. And yet, um, but then the political climate changed a bit in the city in the early 80s. And I wonder if you can elucidate some about those trends. Yeah, and, and I wish I could remember a little more about that, um, more the early movement and Terry Luce will be a great one to visit with, who was a professor of sociology out of TU to help direct the study in like 1977-78 that studied this issue of the need for including in our city ordinances um, sexual orientation as one of the protected classes with regard to uh, public restaurants and public um, um, facilities and so forth. Um, honestly, when we first started forming TOHR, I don't think many of us felt like the discrimination, anti-discrimination ordinance was a, was a huge issue. Because I think we were kind of, you know, middle class, probably not as affected by some of the discrimination that other people felt. So I don't recall us being immediately focused on the more political aspects of the effort in the in the early 80s and it was probably as some additional people became involved in our organization and started wanting to meet with the mayor meet with the city uh, council and we had uh, terry young the mayor like in 84 85 actually come to one of our meetings and throw the softball out at one of the softball mm -hmm. invitational tournaments and i think that awareness started stepping up that we need to do um, more dialogue and more efforts in this whole um, area but I don't recall us being really um, pushing the, the um, issue of sexual orientation through all the games. I, I just don't recall that being uh, in the framework. And it was really when some of us that um, had been involved either in the ACOU or in TOHR 
got more involved in like the Tulsa Human Rights Commission in the mid and early 90s that we kind of resurrected that whole concept that sexual orientation needs to be included in the um, anti-discrimination provision with some help from TOHR, but really took its kind of leadership from the St. Oda Hate Coalition, which was no, another good coalition between the gay community and um, various mainstream organizations, and um, the Tulsa Human Rights Commission that started tackling that issue again in the early 90s and uh, mid-90s. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, what here? When did you, uh, do you recall there being uh, like a new gay newspaper in Tulsa? Um, was that a comparatively recent phenomenon or was that something that occurred pretty early in the... Uh, I'm pretty sure when, when I was um, out at the bars in um, the late 70s, uh, there was a publication uh, and I, I think it was fairly frequent. It was like kind of a memorograph publication talking about a little bit about what was going on. I was carrying some of the national news too. I think the Advocate had been around for a little bit, so they were probably using some of the news clippings from the Advocate for an update. And um, I can't recall the name of some like this week or this month or something like that. Very quickly, when uh, we formed TOHR, we started doing the monthly newsletter because we found it to be very important as a communications tool for our membership and to reach out to those that were in the bars to step up the visibility of TA, TOHR. So we fortunately had some excellent volunteers for the first four or five years of the organization that pulled together the publication, a couple of graphics artists. So we were able to have a pretty nice looking publication fairly early on in um, TOHR's history. And I think it filled a little bit of a void about a really good focus on um, local activities and probably a little bit the bar scene, that's probably a little bit our focus, but a little bit of the national news and help serve as, mm -hmm. serve as the um, primary method of communicating what the next monthly meeting was going to be and so forth. So we pretty quickly had a fairly large mailing list of, of that publication. How would you describe the trajectory of growth of TOHR? Did the community embrace it quickly or was it a Tough mm -hmm. sell to mm -hmm. build the organization. No, I, I think it quickly filled a void of socialization, information, and then um, within a year we had formed, uh, at first mainly the male sports events, the softball, but then uh, many of the women got involved and formed softball leagues within the uh, women's community, and then we, as I recall, our volleyball team were almost always co-ed, and they started within the first year or so, too, of TOHR. Now, did they mainstream into, like, a citywide league? Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we did play in the citywide leagues, and that continued for two or three years, as I recall. And then we had bowling that was very co-ed, and all this was in the first two or three years. So what, what you could see is the community was really um, ripe for that kind of an organization something to socialize outside of the gay bars. Nothing wrong with the bars. They feel a very important socialization vehicle that people would go there and then also want to do something during the day or be a little bit more educated through the monthly meetings and so forth. So I think our meetings and our activities you know, quickly went from 25 or so and the meetings quickly grew to 100 or more and then our softball teams, gosh, I mean, we exploded on the number of softball so we had probably had more teams at one time than Houston and Dallas and Kansas City had because it was fulfilled such an important role. And definitely on the female side, we had three or four teams, which was probably far more than like a Dallas had that were strictly lesbian teams at least. Um, and sponsored some of the first um, softball tournaments in this part of the country. And, you know, one year we had a team from Boston and a team from LA that came to join our softball invitation, Southwest Softball Invitational Tournament. And that continued for about six years, the softball tournaments did. And they would draw several hundred people out during the summer for the, oh, it was actually usually Labor Day weekends, I think, when we had our tournament. And we'd draw several hundred spectators out there for the activities. And we'd have some socialization activities in the evening. So I think it quickly filled that role. And then even through 84, 85, 86, as we 
brought in some well-known speakers and well-known people in the um, GLBT scene. Such as? Oh, um, Valerie Torino, the mayor of West Hollywood, um, the um, uh, Virginia Puzo, oh. who served as, yeah. yeah, and I can't remember if she was with NGTLF at that time, or if she was already working in the mayor's office. And she became an aide to the mayor, right, in New right, York in City. City right. Yeah. Uh, but she was a very dynamic speaker and came here. Um, later, Matt Levitch, who had been serving in the military mm -hmm. and came and spoke here. Um, it seemed like we had a couple of others, too. And I think fairly early on, we had somebody from the HRC come and visit, too, in the Tulsa community. So uh, our meeting still seemed to fulfill a very important need with the AIDS information too and the A45 time frame, they became a, a good focus. Now, I wasn't as active in the organization probably from 86 to about 89, then I got back involved in 89 and 90. Um, so I can't recall going to every meeting and, and knowing what the size of the crowds were, but the sporting events definitely tapered off by about 86. Um, I think it kind of ran its course. Um, softball tournament activity throughout the country was starting to kind of die off for some reason. And I guess maybe people just had gotten more socialized and found some other outlets uh, for their um, interests. Um, and we just saw kind of that tapering off, I think, countrywide. And we, we saw it here a little bit in mm -hmm. Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really aware that there are the organized softball tournaments like there used to be. Mm -hmm. That's one that I'm aware of you know, yeah. anybody. And although I think there's still a bowling league around, um, it had, it's been off and on, and we don't have really any organized volleyball or other sporting events at this point mm -hmm. in time. So I guess we've matured a little bit and, and not really sure if those activities are of interest to people again or not, uh, but we clearly don't attract the number of people to our activities like we used to in the early 80s, but that's probably true of the too. Right, right. Now, um, in 1978 in California, there was a statewide effort to ban gay and lesbian teachers from working in the public school system. That ultimately was defeated. But a similar law was passed in Oklahoma uh, and ultimately became a, an important precedent because the Supreme Court struck down the policy. Does, the, do you recall whether or not TOHR had any uh, response to that important legal case or? No, I don't, Laura, although I'm pretty sure that Bob English, um, who probably wasn't active with TOHR at that point in time, but it seemed like he assisted a few teachers on trying to fight that statute at the Oklahoma level. I, I just remember sitting at work having some telephone conversations about the strategy on fighting that statute, but it may have been more from the ACLU perspective than it was from the TOHR perspective. Mm -hmm. So there's always that crossover. Many of us were involved in both groups at that point in time, and I, I don't recall that really being a banner issue that the TOHR took up as a cause. Right. I just don't really recall in the 80s us doing a whole lot of political advocacy type things. Our, our focus tended to be on some of the health issues or starting another program called the Aid Support Program that was a little bit of a spinoff from TOHR to help get those state funds in to help on the education prevention efforts here in the Tulsa area. So I know a lot of us were tied up on that. That's why I wasn't really active with TOHR from like 88 to 89 or 87 to 89 because we so much were focused on the Aid Support Program. Um, so I just, I don't recall the, the state statute school teachers issue. How did the AIDS epidemic affect your social network, your, your life personally? Mm -hmm. um, certainly have lost uh, some friends, uh, particularly in the 80s, uh, to AIDS and became certainly very aware of it. Um, had other friends like in Houston um, or Washington that, that either became involved in in the clinics there or the housing programs there and so stayed in touch with them, kind of how they were dealing with it in Houston, the Washington area. One friend was really involved in the uh, 
Swidman Walker Clinic in D.C., mm -hmm. which um, had been fighting uh, the cause early on uh, with regard to both prevention as well as treatment in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, so I think a lot of us just unfortunately started living with the fact that we, we were in some friends that were going to die, and I think it's really a, a realization that I had probably in the mid-80s, really before I started losing so many friends to AIDS, I lost like two within a year to suicide. And, and it was probably related to some gay issues, you know, depression, alcoholism, mm -hmm. drug abuse, mm -hmm. um, some of the things that certainly uh, are too overwhelming to some people in the, in the community. We suffer more than our share, I'm sure, of alcoholism mm -hmm. and drug abuse. So, uh, you know, pretty early on, some of us started realizing we were going to lose some people and then some of it was self-inflicted, but then as the age had been kicked in, we, we really became uh, more aware uh, that we were going to lose some people, primarily out of the uh, male populace mm -hmm. dealing with mm -hmm. the HIV issue. Now, it didn't really affect me personally in the way that I was leading my life because uh, I'd always been pretty careful <laughs> about my sexual activities, I uh, think. Thankfully, but um, I think I surely influenced a lot of people to, to really be much more careful about their sexual practices. Right. And we hopefully helped on that through our education and outreach mm -hmm. efforts. Mm -hmm. Now, it's no secret that uh, evangelical Christianity is an important public presence in Tulsa um, with Oral Roberts and Green Bible College and Victory Christian. Um, do you have any recollections of the fundamentalist response to the early stages of AIDS and or the more public presence of the gay community in Tulsa? Certainly was aware of it at the national level. You know, see the national articles, right. you know, condemning homosexuality and so forth. Right. Um, in Tulsa, I quickly, when I moved here, uh, affiliated with All Souls Unitarian because so much of the activism in the Tulsa community has kind of flowed out of that church. Involvement with the ACU, most of the people I knew through the ACU had some affiliation with All Souls. So I guess I was somewhat insulated from that in that I'd grown up Presbyterian but really quickly migrated to the uh, Unitarian Church fairly soon after I moved here. Um, um, I, yes, I do remember some instances where particularly Oral Roberts would be outspoken about uh, trying to make sure that they didn't have gay students and that uh, they didn't think they had gay students and, and they did have some witnesses uh, that would, the students that would uh, particularly watch zippers to make sure that no students went into zippers and you could tell if they were there because of the way they were dressed and the way they were hanging around the front. But certainly every now and then some people that I knew that were more Robert students uh, came into Zippers because I knew some of them. One of them uh, lived with me at my house one summer. Um, so they were very much focused on um, making sure that they were protecting their flock, I guess, out at LRU from uh, their gay tendencies, uh, like going to the gay bar. And then when we first started THR and first set up the uh, helpline, um, there was evidently an attempt by students at Raymond Bible School to uh, tie up our line. They took a pledge, evidently, as the rumor we heard, um, to just call and harass us on the phone line and do a lot of hang-ups. And we had a tremendous call volume in the six months, first six months of having um, 743 days, which is still the number that mm -hmm. we have. And there was a big attempt, I think, by them to really give us some grief over that telephone line. But, I think we finally wore them down and stayed with our gay information line, which was really a very valuable service, particularly in the 80s, because so many people were dealing with their sexuality and didn't have another outlet, mm -hmm. didn't talk to their parents, didn't talk to their friends, didn't feel like they could, couldn't talk to people at school. So I think the information line served a very valuable purpose then, and we certainly do not get near the number of calls in that line that we used to. I, I used to work a lot in you know, in a three-hour period, you could easily take 20 calls. Some on HIV, AIDS, but a lot of about just dealing with coming out. And now, if you work the center, you might get three or four calls while you're down there 
working the scene. Mm-hmm. And of course, you used to get a lot of blog calls too, you know, here, what, what, what can I go for civilization right. and right. that kind of stuff. Um, the other reaction by the religious community in Tulsa, I think, um, has not been particularly uh, negative towards TOHR when we did the um, Committee on Sexual Orientation Discrimination and the Human Rights Commission in 94 and 95, and we had three public hearings. Um, the committee members, and, and I co-chaired that committee along with Bill Hinkle, we really did get blasted in the public hearings by many fundamentalist ministers, conservative ministers, and some of their uh, congregation. And, and so we really saw kind of a, a, a a little bit of an ugly head at that point in time with regard to the uh, clash between what they believe were some of their values and, and what we were trying to do is have some dialogue on this issue. Sometimes it was really pretty difficult to have dialogue because right. it was uh, just kind of quoting the Bible and there wasn't really a chance to let's explore this as a, a, as a uh, uh, human issue and and not everyone's going to be a member of your congregation, so what's the appropriate response at a city level and a governmental level and so forth? So I think that issue precipitated more negative reaction from a segment of the religious community, community than anything else I recall, other than, you know, the protests that we did get at the, at the uh, Pride Parade. Right. But that's you know, definitely a couple of groups there that were over us and strictly focused on uh, being there, fostering their pride. So I think those are the two visible elements that we've seen in the mm-hmm. mm-hmm. during the discussion of the Committee on Sexual Orientation Discrimination and the Gay Pride picnic itself, and then the Gay Pride Parade. Right. Right. Let's go back to something a little more fun, not so <laughs> political. Uh, where did you and your friends hang out? Uh, any particular his- establishments, neighborhoods, parks, homes, or places that were and are popular? Um, uh, I think a lot of my friends, we, we socialize around zippers and, and Tim's, the bars. Um, but pretty quickly after we formed POHR, we, we really did try to mainstream our social activities. So. We'd go to the bowling alley and, you know, take over several alleys at the bowling alley. We, we had um, a pick up volleyball games down at the river parks. Um, and we were always down there. I can't even remember what, what evening uh, during the summertime and on the weekends as I call it into the wintertime. So we're right out there in the river parks. You know, it's our park too. So we had the volleyball activities. Uh, a lot of the softball games were pe- played throughout the city parks here in Tulsa. Parks Department has always been very helpful, very supportive, mm-hmm. providing the facilities that we needed, whether it was an organized invitational tournament or just the, an organized games that we play. Um, so really, I think we've been pretty widespread in our use of the, the public facilities throughout the community. And so we hang out to a, a lot of this around these organized activities. That, that's generally been my focus mm-hmm. and a lot of my friends mm-hmm. around the more organized activities. Mm-hmm. That's what I would call. Okay. You know, there was only one incident that we had that was kind of a, a difficult time with the Parks Department. It was uh, in 1983 when we rented Manion Park Pool, and the purpose of that was to celebrate the third anniversary of Tulsa Oklahoma's for Human Rights, or then uh, the Tulsa chapter of Oklahoma's for Human Rights. And we, rented a public swimming pool at Manion Park, hired a couple of their lifeguards, had a picnic, had a great time for two or three hours by renting this uh, pool, and kind of after hours, so it must have been like a Saturday, late Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening, it was in July. And we had some um, safe sex materials that we handed out there, you know, focus on how to prevent syphilis and mm-hmm. gonorrhea. And, some people left those brochures either in the park or at the pool, and some kids in the neighborhood picked those up, took them home to their parents, and those parents complained to the parks department about, who'd you rent this pool to? And um, uh, the parks department, at the suggestion of the Tulsa City County Health Department, then drained that pool two days later and refilled it. And we got some definite publicity on that in the local and the national news about Tulsa, Oklahoma, the 
Health Department suggests that the city drain a pool after gays use it for a function. <laughs> but actually, it kind of played into a very good PR coup for QHR because Dr. Beale was very willing to go as our medical spokesman and say how ridiculous this was that the Health Department had made that recommendation to the Parks Department, that the Parks Department had done that, and both departments said, you know, we overreacted based upon what we know about um, HIV and AIDS, and it became an education issue where they turned around and said, we boo-booed, and this is why you can't get AIDS from a swimming pool. <laughs> and we, we got a fair amount of local press from that. But that's the only time I think I would call us having a hiccup with the Parks Department. It's a pretty major one. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> um, was Tulsa any less tolerant of homosexuality than other places you lived? And well, it sounds like you've lived here a long time, yeah. uh, or visited more so, perhaps. Like, yeah, I, I would definitely think going to school in Austin for three years that I had the feeling. You can go ahead. I'm going to put the heat up. <laughs> sure, that I had the feeling um, that Austin was definitely a more progressive, accepting community than Tulsa was then, and certainly probably Tulsa is now. Um, so you always wonder, why don't you live in the more accepting the community? But you know, you make your friends here, and this becomes your frontier. And I remember we were talking about that, both at TOHR and with the ACLU. I mean, you could be in a San Francisco, and you're not going to have near the influence on some of the uh, more progressive issues and pushing diversity in a San Francisco or a Austin than you might have here in Tulsa, because uh, there are not as many of us, and it's not as accepted. So. Uh, you've really got uh, your PR challenge uh, before you. Uh, so definitely I, I would have a feeling that, that Austin was a much more progressive, accepting environment. Although when I was at the law school, there was not a, a gay student chapter in the law school. I think it was about five years later that a, a gay student, a law student group was actually formed. And I can tell you if that was formed with any resistance or not there. So I'm not sure TU was that much far behind them forming maybe a, a gay um, a law students group. Um, so no doubt, obviously, we've had a lot of challenges in Tulsa and Oklahoma. And a lot of my friends have not had to go through some of the same issues in Houston or Washington and in Dallas that, that we've had to deal with here. The challenge for us is that in those other cities, it's clear that the city leaders are much more willing to talk about um, GLBT issues than they are in the Tulsa area. I mean, it's just hard to get LGBT issues as a discussion on any city council, right. probably. Right. Whereas that's a totally different situation in the Dallas where uh, there's a lot of protection there, a lot of dialogue, good relationships. I think that they're very visible gay community. And maybe part of it is because we don't really have a um, a gay ghetto here like, like they do in the Dallas and the Houston, you know, a really identifiable segment of the city that is kind of the vibrant center of the uh, LGBT activity. We just don't seem to have that in mm -hmm. Tulsa. Why ever, why, for whatever reason, we're much more spread out than even in the city. We don't have that center. Maybe that center does give you a little more political, uh, persuasive uh, ability than we have in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. But Tulsa's a conservative city, conservative leadership, Conservative uh, corporations, you know, a lot of them have been willing to uh, be real active about taking the diversity issue. It's taken larger national corporations, American Airlines, for example, adopting benefits that have been built to them from the Tulsa community before our community was really, really, really considered. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're definitely uh, at the frontier here, I think. Yeah, in many ways. Yep. Um, Let's talk about sex. <laughs> uh, where did gay and bisexual men in Tulsa go if they wanted to have a sexual experience when you first arrived here in the late 70s? Um, now, uh, as apart from meeting somebody, actually having a sexual relationship. Like, uh, you know, just if you wanted to go and have like a quick and dirty right. one night stand, were there <laughs> notorious places in town that you could go to? find such a thing? Well, I'm sure any of the bars could offer that opportunity. Um, I think when I was uh, moved here, 
there there was some sexual activity on Turkey Mountain in West Tulsa where guys probably went to meet other guys and probably had some of them had sex there in the wilds of Turkey Mountain. I guess a little bit of that in the river parks. And, and, and indeed, I do, I certainly recall since I jogged the river parks, from time to time, the uh, undercover officers have uh, tried to uh, break up some of the more public sex that might occur in some of the restrooms like at 19th and Riverside. Some of that's understandable, certainly allegations that some of the cops cross the line and are actually soliciting as opposed to observing. Uh, I think that's probably the case from time to time. It's been an issue with Mike Green and me. At one time, we thought we did a little sting operation. It'd be interesting to have somebody that uh, was an attractive male that would be wired go to the bathrooms to see if some of these cops were really very aggressive towards the, the wired guy to see if perhaps the cops were overstepping their bounds and then take that to the FBI and see if we can make a civilized action out of that. We never did that, and it was probably more Mike's issue than, than mine because he ended up representing so many of these people that were picked up down the river parks, and a couple of them more than once. Uh, so there was definitely, I should back up on the police arrest, but that issue where the, the feeling that perhaps the cops were getting too aggressive uh, and trying to flush out some of the more public sex, but maybe actually enticing some of the conversations that were occurring. So I think the River Parks and Turkey Mountain and, and I guess Mohawk Park in North Tulsa was probably a, an area where uh, at least there was some impression that, that you might uh, go and, and meet somebody and, and maybe have sex actually in that park. I don't really hear much about that these days. I, I just wonder if it's as prevalent as it was then. And in, in Mohawk Park, there had been at least one murder it was probably related to um, a sexual encounter. And as I recall, that happened in the late 80s. So I think people became aware that hey, this could be a dangerous activity mm -hmm. too. Um, so those are probably the places that, that I would call. Right, Were there ever any gala, social, or drag balls in Tulsa that uh, you heard about? Or, I mean, is there a, was this been a big element of the public persona of the gay community in Tulsa, or? You know, I'm, I'm just not real aware of, of, the, of, the, of the drag uh, community. I think that since we've had some um, um, drag queens win, you know, the national uh, uh, crown and, and certainly their home crown. Yes, I think there is um, a viable element of the drag community in, in Tulsa and some that have been very instrumental in fundraising, both for HIV and to some extent for TOHR and, you know, that project Open Arms, which does youth outreach now. Uh, I think the drag community has really helped support them. Um, I just am not real familiar with the location and the personalities mm -hmm. and so forth. Now, very early on, I think it was well, like 81, TOHR actually sponsored a turnabout drag show where people that typically aren't in drag you know, got up and did an annual fundraiser that was very popular for about six or seven years and raised a fair amount of money for TOHR and was one of our primary fundraisers. And then another group that, that um, I helped co-found sponsored the black and white balls, which occurred from 81 through 90, 1990, and became very large social events once a year, usually the first part of the summer or the end of spring. And there was a fair amount of drag on it there because it was a very dress-up function. Black and white was the theme. And uh, there was a fair number of you know, cross-dressing at that, mm -hmm. that event, so both, um, you know, gals dressing up as guys and guys dressing up as gals. Uh, but that was not the majority of the people. The majority of the people, you know, stay with, I guess, their gender clothing, whatever that might be, but certainly a little bit more outrageous than normal. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So that wasn't particularly a drag ball, but it became a pretty big social event. It was not particularly a fundraiser. It was more of a, we just had a good time putting it on, and then in the last four or five years, we started charging enough, enough and maybe we made eight or ten thousand dollars a year, and we give that back to the community on char, um, aid support program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, seemed like there was a couple of the testing plan. We usually get some of the funds and so forth. A couple more questions. We only got about ten more minutes left. Um, how about her welding? Were you involved with the the creation of her welding? Coming this up in two days. Right. I've always wondered where that came from. Now this is so embarrassing because I can't remember exactly if I was an original host or not. <laughs> but I remember how we first started having functions at Harwell and, and I don't recall that I was one of the first um, uh, sponsors. But TOHR in 83, 84, some people felt it was too social. So another group uh, including a good friend of mine and my roommate formed a group called Trey Day, very gay, <laughs> and they decided to have some social functions so that POHR wouldn't be labeled with being so social. They'd be the social group and we could do more of the education, the outreach and advocacy mm -hmm. Trump. And so, as I recall, they had one or two spring functions at Harwell, and then that eventually became this Harwell, the party that's now during the Christmas holiday as opposed to the springtime. And um, it's it's had a different mix of hosts from time to time, but some of the hosts like Bob English and Kyle Foster have been with it about ever since the origination of the, the Trey Day movement and have been with this whole wellness party for a number of years. So really it's it's just another kind of social outreach that spun off from a lot of the people that had been involved with POHR originally. And the reason was they just felt like there was another important social outlet that probably wasn't, that it was best not for it to be directly affiliated with mm -hmm. TOHR, not have the financial liabilities, TOHR didn't have any financial liabilities in with this party, and it just became kind of a thing of its own. So that party kind of anchored the, the Christmas activities, and then our black and white kind of anchored this social time mm -hmm. in, in the May and June um, time frame. And, and that, Black and white ended with the bang in 1990 with our 10th anniversary, and we had uh, actually like 1,300 people there in the village. People came, and that was the group that we brought in for <laughs> entertainment. They were just starting to make their comeback a little bit in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of what I would call about the, the Harwell. But I think those are great examples of, of particularly Harwell, and why it can be so important to keep those functions going because. A lot of people, particularly if it were a little closer to Christmas than it is this year, but it gets a lot of people back that are coming to see their family or their friends and go to Harwell and they'll have a chance to interact with them, see what's going on in New York, where they might be from, or mm -hmm. Washington, or whatever. So it's a great opportunity to meet and visit with different people. Right. Well, one last question. Yeah. You left TOHR for several years, and now you're back. Right. Why did you decide to do that? Mm -hmm. How do you think the organization has changed since you were one of its founders? Well, I, I came back and, and after we uh, did the aid support program in 90, or 87 to about 89, I, I kind of focused on that group and was on the board of the Oakland City chapter and our chapter. So we got back involved with the POHR in 89 and, and 90. And then in, in 90, I got more involved with Ray, Regional AIDS Interface Network. And that really took up a lot of time because it's that team working with clients and we were doing that through all souls so we're trying to build up that interaction with all souls so you know you can only do that one or two nonprofits at a time plus your regular job so focused on rain for about three or four years and then frankly kind of got burned out on that because it's a very demanding um, and important activity but, but you know a lot of people can only do it for a few years or so mm -hmm. then got involved in the human rights commission and felt that was important to kind of help mainstream this gay issue, and we did the Committee on Sexual Orientation Discrimination. And then I was asked to come on board with Youth Services at Tulsa, primarily because they wanted a gay board member since they were doing this program called TYUD, Tulsa Youth Discovery University, and they felt it was important to have on their large board at least one person out of the gay community. So that board was an incredibly active, exciting board, and I learned a lot uh, during my 
firm, they adopted sexual orientation as part of their policy and did a lot of good outreach into the gay and lesbian community. So it is important for those of us that can have the time to also work on some of the larger mainstream boards so that you, as an openly out so, lesbian or gay, so that was kind of my focus. And then when my term ended with youth services, like it's been the seven years that their bylaws permit, uh, then I could get refocused on QHR. We're doing a lot of neat, exciting things, including hopefully our history project. And so I was kind of invigorated and ready to come back. Mm -hmm. Well, Dennis, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. This concludes this interview. Thank you.